Hey church, welcome to an online worship service at Agora Bible Fellowship. You know, some weeks I quote the scripture, some weeks I talk about my feelings. This week I want to talk about music theory, my favorite topic, and I know interesting to all of you at home. So most songs are in 4-4 time, which is like 1, 2, 3, 4, and the subdivision is 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, or 1-E and a 2-E and a 3, right? 4-4 time, or 3-4 time, 1-2-3, 1-2-3, flowing like a waltz, 2-3. Most songs are in those two time signatures or some variation of them. But this song we're going to sing is in a really rare time. It's called 12-8, so it's like 1 2 3 da 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 ba 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 So it's got like a triplet and a backbeat feel. And it just gives it this cool, like, kind of vibe. And we were singing it in rehearsal, and I was like, this is such a cool song. I'm going to talk about 12-8 time to the people at home. Let's sing it, because this is getting boring, yeah? Here we go. today we worship today he came to us in grace and in truth still with us and still on the road the same jesus he's making us new
Sing that with us. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the for a second. Let's stay in this space just for one moment. I know there's a lot of people out there that have got a lot of anxiety over stuff that's going on in the world. So I just want to offer up a prayer. Father God, for everyone who's feeling anxiety, whether it be over COVID, 
over politics, over economy, whatever it is. I just want to let them know that you see them. I want to make space in this prayer for anyone who's got their anxiety to just be seen by the Heavenly Father. And God, in this space, I want to repeat this phrase, which has been echoed around your throne since the days of Isaiah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Say it again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. One more time. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. It's in Jesus' mighty and strong name we conclude this time of worship by saying together, amen. All right, it's a true confession time. That spontaneous worship moment was recorded after the announcements, so brace yourself for an awkward transition. Ladies and gentlemen, Josh Antioho. Well, howdy-do, Agora Bible Fellowship. It is wonderful to see you on this interweb-based worship service. Hello. Hopefully you're having an amazing day so far. My name is Josh. I'm the high school pastor here at the church. Have a couple of announcements for you today. First of all, uh, if there's anything that we could be praying for you for, uh, go ahead and text that prayer request to 97,000. We would love to pray for you this week. Please do it. That'd be great. A couple of things coming up here over the next few weeks. We are starting up and launching some new life groups. So, Whether you want to do an online group or an in-person group, we kind of have groups for everybody. So if you're interested in a little bit of community during this time, uh, go ahead and email Kevin at kevin at agorabible.org. That'd be sweet. We'll get you hooked up with a life group coming up here pretty soon. We have a new group starting up for any moms, any and all moms. It's called Moms in Motion, and it is going to be on Wednesdays starting this Wednesday at 10 a.m. at the church campus. There's going to be some uh, exercise time with stroller walks and runs, some toddler songs, some calisthenics, some play time, some prayer time, lots of good stuff for moms. All moms welcome. Go ahead and check that out. Again, that's starting this Wednesday. We'd love to see you out for that. If you are a football fan or a fan of food, our Super Bowl party is coming up. Second annual Super Bowl party. Super Bowl party coming up two weeks from now on February 7th. That's Super Bowl Sunday. Hopefully, we've got the Buffalo Bills playing against the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That's what I'm hoping for. Uh, It's probably going to be the other two, but whatever. Uh, So come out and hang out with us. We're going to be out in the courtyard here at the church. We're going to have lots of food. It's going to be a great time. We'd love to see you out for that. Uh, Thank you so much for your continued giving. Um, You can give online, you can mail in a check, and we just wanted to make a note, man, if you've been joining us here online and you've been blessed by these uh, church services every week, even if you don't live in the area, you don't consider ABF necessarily your home church, maybe you do now because you've been watching the services, man, if you feel led, uh, we'd ask that you just pray through potentially supporting the the services and the ministries here at this church financially, that'd be really sweet. Uh, Well, we love you guys, have a wonderful day and enjoy this message from Pastor Scott. Well, greetings, church. So good to be with you. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Josh, for uh, the announcements. And uh, always fun uh, to have different people on stage with us. Uh, This evening, uh, we have Mr. Chase Kegel here, which we're really excited about for the first time. And this is an open invite. If you guys ever have an itch to be as part of the, the stage Uh, crew here. That sounds funny, stage crew. Uh, You're always welcome. I am more than happy to kick some of these regulars to the curb and make room for you. And so uh, just that's an ongoing invitation. Well, we're continuing in the book of John, and I always encourage you to turn uh, with us there. It's so much easier to work through these texts together. We're starting John chapter 12, really the second half of our uh, book study, working through Uh, This beautiful account of Jesus' life now kind of honing in on the last week of Jesus' life before his death, burial, and resurrection. So excited to be in that. But in setting up the topic, I'm wondering, here's a a question for you. How many of us have had a chance at some point in our life to visit Switzerland? I don't know. Have you guys been there? Adrian, have you been there? 
wow, I'm, I guess I Chase, you, you and I are the only ones that haven't been. Uh, but one of the things that I think is kind of cool over the years about Switzerland, I've learned uh, in, interesting facts about their reputation. They're kind of known for somehow remaining neutral in the middle of craziness, wars all around them. I was reading just uh, today that they were uh, effectively able to skip participation in World War I and participation in World War II. In fact, they have not participated in a war since 1815. Pretty crazy. So when somebody uses the expression, they usually use it. They say like, hey, I'm Switzerland on this topic. A lot of times used with controversial topics that they would rather avoid uh, getting sucked into. And I, I was thinking about that. I was like, man, that's a lot of what the our church to some degree has tried to walk that line effectively in the past 12 months. Let me explain a little bit of what I mean. In the last year, it's been tri pretty tricky to navigate kind of all the crazy, potentially divisive things in our country. There's been potential landmines to church unity left and right, whether it's COVID response, whether it's masks, whether it's vaccines, whether it's church closure, whether it's race issues, police force, whether it's riots versus uh, what's the other term? Riots or peaceful protests? So whether whether it's politics, whether it's presidential candidate preferences, there's been so many things that are have a tug for the church to participate in and to be potentially very divisive. I've realized even in our own church family, and you have people on of complete opposite ends of the spectrum on most every single topic that I mentioned. Some people have wished that I would be a little bit more taking a stand on all of these different topics, but it's not because of a lack of opinion that I haven't. Is that correct, Adrian? And in fact, it's not because of a, a be, being a, a softy or a pushover. In fact, any of you are always welcome to buy me lunch and I'll share my opinions with you at any point you like. Uh, I, I have lots of thoughts on these different subjects, but I've been very protective of what happens here from the pulpit. The reason behind that is because in our country, these things have not become areas of conversation. Instead, they've become dividing lines. They've been fighting terms. They, they've, been, they've been a reason for people to can one person to cancel another person. And so we haven't chosen to engage in a lot of these topics for that reason, because when I look back and across the, the ministry landscape, I'm like, you know what? There's only a select few things, a select few hills that I'm willing to die on. And really, rarely are they cultural or political. They're almost always biblical or theological. So we don't avoid topics, uh, uh, really tough topics that our cultural culture is wrestling through, things that we believe are biblical, Last week, we spent some time taking time to identify and, and celebrate the, what we believe is important as it relates to the sanctity of human life. We talked about that. You can think really most every week we address a, a topic that's relevant, but maybe not getting into the weeds with some of the sticky conversations from present day. Well, here, as I talk about things that are worth hills that are worth dying for, things that you can't really stay on the fence, and you see in our title already, there's really no room in the middle as it relates to our response to Jesus Christ. There's no, no room to kind of be divided and kind of play Switzerland if you want. There's no, no uh, ability to kind of be on the fence. In fact, he describes that person in scripture as being lukewarm and somebody that he wants to spit out of his mouth. Instead, we're called to make a choice, get off the fence, decide where we find ourselves in response to Jesus Christ. That's where our text takes us today. I'm excited to go through this with you. Let me pray before we do that though. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your word we thank you for the fact that you reign over all of these issues, God. The fact that you are the source of truth. And that's why we keep coming back to your word to seek truth. Pray that we'd be a, 
a spirit-led church that we respond in the same way that Paul charged Timothy as he's talking to him as a young pastor to lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Trying to find the right balance of that and the tension of this world is a tricky one. And so we lean heavily, depend on your spirit. God, we now ask that you speak to us through this text. We invite that. We're excited to be in your word. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. All right, so starting in chapter 12, we're going to see some different responses, uh, the, the full spectrum of responses to Jesus Christ. There's kind of come to the point in his ministry where it's no longer on the line. He's coming. He's very vocal about being the Messiah. People have to choose what they're going to do. There's a wanted poster at the local uh, post office. And so people have to decide what they're going to do with Jesus. We'll see first some folks that are fully in. It says at the beginning of chapter 12, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of the, his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. All right, we'll stop there and talk a little bit about this a little interaction and what's going on there. I don't know if you'd describe yourself as frugal or not, but some of us tend to be bent a little bit more that direction than others. I don't know where you guys are on the spectrum. We uh, have fun as a family talking about Adrian's grandmother because as she got a little bit older, her frugality was amplified. I don't know if that's an age thing or what, but we joke with her parents because her, her parents, when they're kind of cleaning out her place space, found all these things that she would store and keep. One of the ones that was most interesting, she really loved these little puddings, these uh, little miniature puddings. In fact, that was like 90% of her diet close to the end. She loved these things. And in her place, man, they found mounds of these empty, cleaned out, perfectly stored pudding things. We're still not sure what her plan was for usage later on, but it was definitely a frugality thing. Some of us have our own weird quirks like that. Man, I'll tell you what, the thing that gets me on frugality like nothing else is duration of showers in my household. If you have teenage kids or a wife, uh, you'll understand what I'm talking about with that. And so for me, it's, it's in and out in two minutes, uh, obviously, because uh, I'm follically challenged. But either way, frugality is definitely a thing. And it's something to be celebrated, appreciated, maybe laughed about. In this context, we see that Jesus actually pushes back in a certain instance as it relates to this. Let me give a little backdrop of the story, though. Basically, as I mentioned last week, I said, man, after Lazarus was raised from the dead, what seemed to be missing from the, the account? There was no celebration. There was no party. Well, I was thrilled to read this because finally they're having a dinner in honor of Jesus. What had happened there? Lazarus is lounging there with him, spending time celebrating what should be celebrated. Jesus had brought, showed his authority over death and brought him from death back to life. An incredible thing. His experience would be one that would never be forgotten. So they're having a dinner in his honor, a proper celebration of sorts. And Luke records that it's being led or run to some degree by Mary and Martha. This was obviously, as their close friends, a common thing. A few months prior, you might even remember an account of them having another time with Mary and Martha and Jesus at a meal time. 
where they are arguing as sisters, actually just Martha getting annoyed with Mary's non-participation in preparing the meal. This isn't that interaction. This is a whole different interaction just the same week of Jesus' death. One's given an account in Matthew and Mark. This one, we clarify, it's a different a meal that took place, this one happening at Simon the leper's house, we learn in the account in Matthew and Mark, another man that Jesus had healed. So Martha's serving in the way that she knows best. We shouldn't belittle that. Some of us are wired up with that gift to serve behind the scenes. I'll tell you what, a church could not exist without those folks. We're super grateful, and I think God is completely honored by the person that's helping out behind the scenes. You notice there's no kind of clue or resemblance of kind of complaining from her. It's done with a heart of gratitude, acting out as a servant. But Mary seems to be the more emotional and reflective of the two sisters. It's interesting to me if you do a study on Mary's life and her interactions with Jesus. Really, every scene that she's in, she's always found in the exact same place, at Jesus' feet. Kind of a cool thing, a cool reality about her life. It tells us a little bit of something about what a, a genuine, authentic relationship with Jesus looks like. It starts with coming to his feet, bowing before him. That's how she approached him. And she comes with this startling and spontaneous act of worship. What does she do? What does it say there in the text? She takes this perfume very valuable perfume. It says a, a pound of it. That would be equivalent in their measuring to about 12 ounces of a perfume that they car- called nard. That actually sounds a little too close to lard. Uh, but either way, it was something in that day and age is something that was very valuable. I was reading about it this week. It was found from a, uh, a fragrant, it was a fragrant oil extract from a plant native to the mountains in Northern India. So really a lot of the cost was attached to from getting it th- from one place to another, but very valued. In fact, we learn here in the description in a moment that Judas gives that it was worth 300 denarii. Just to give you a perspective there, that was about with the average income, that was about a year's wages. Can you imagine that amount being broken at Jesus's feet? Bring to mind maybe what your annual income is and bring that amount and say, man, what would it look like to take that dollar amount and lay it, literally wipe it onto Jesus's feet? A beautiful picture of, of, of Mary demonstrating her commitment and love for Jesus. I'll be honest though, every time I read about anything dealing with feet, it's always a little bit awkward, right? It's a little bit off. Sometimes you read this, and I don't know, I get a little uncomfortable with the idea of having feet washed. I think I've mentioned this before, but early in Adrianized dating, we were at some church thing. I haven't been to a ton of church things that require feet washing, but we were there and it was weird. Adrian said she was this close to breaking up with me, but either way, we made it through that. And in this experience, imagine this scene. Imagine this scene. You're just showing up. It's normally a servant that cleans somebody's feet, but instead, It's a broken bottle of perfume. And and what really takes it to the next level, it's not just about feet. What takes it to the next level is what she does to clean up the perfume. What does it say in the text? What does she use? Her own hair. You don't realize how how one uh, that could be seen as a, man, that's just kind of a, uh, uh, just a, a demonstration of complete, surrender and submission. A Jewish woman didn't even take her hair down on occasions in public. So what is happening here is such an extreme picture of devotion and commitment and something that Jesus notices. And we're told that we're, the account that's giving of this is, tells us in Mark's account that Jesus says this noble act will be mentioned as a memorial to her love every time the gospel is taught. Kind of cool when you think about it, because even in these moments, as we talk about it, it's Jesus's words coming to fruition. He said every time it's being taught that it would be mentioned, and here we are mentioning it as it's taught. You wonder why it's attached to the gospel. 
I would suggest if you really think about it, it shows the expectation of coming to Jesus with full abandon, abandonment. This is a, an accurate estimate of what he's worth. It's a demonstration of what it looks like when you're saying, you know what, I'm not concerned what I look like. I'm not concerned with what it costs. I am fully in. When you're trying to get a picture of a response to the gospel, that is the picture Jesus wanted to make sure was etched into our minds whenever we thought about the gospel. That's a picture of what commitment and submission looks like. Now you think about that as it contrasts Mary's selfless devotion with Judas's selfish rebuke. Think about this. This is getting very close to when Judas is about to, getting very close to betraying Jesus. One of his 12 disciples getting close to turning him over to be crucified, to be murdered. So I imagine as he's at this feast that's intended to honor Jesus, everything about it irritated him. Just, man, everything, there's, there's this inner thing happening, I imagine, in his, in his heart, in his mind. And he couldn't wait for any opportunity to disrupt the celebration. He sees this as the perfect opportunity. He sees this opportunity as a self-righteous mean to break up the party. Why was this ointment not sold and the money given to take care of the poor? It's interesting because he wanted to sound compassionate. I also found it interesting in my study that this is actually the very first chronologically that we hear of any statement by, made by Judas in the New Testament. His very first statement, though, John, our author, points out his motives were off base. Notice what it says. Not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bags, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Basically, Judas has been disillusioned by Jesus. Maybe he thought he was along for a ride to be part of the, a kingdom that Jesus, that Jesus would be setting up. But now as he's seeing that, wait a second, my master is about to die. He's wanting to make sure that as much money as could be accumulated would stay in the pot for the other side of all of this. He wanted to protect that. And so when he sees money not being added to the pot, he wants to do anything he can to protect that. You notice though that this would be a, Kind of a logical argument. In fact, in the other accounts found in Matthew and Mark, we're told that the other disciples joined in the rebuke. They joined in the rebuke because that's a, maybe a common question that somebody might ask. Wait, isn't that a, a waste of resources to be used in this manner? It's an interesting question for us still today. What is actually worth it when it relates to Jesus? What Jesus does is he corrects them. He tells them, leave her alone. Man, it would have taken a lot of restraint if I was Jesus in these moments to not confront Judas and be like, you dirty rotten, especially when you know somebody's motives. Be one thing to remain silent about something when you don't know what's going on in their heart, but when you know the motives behind it, like John did in retrospect, when you know those things, man, it would take such restraint but instead he says to leave her alone because it's preparation for burial. It wasn't because he was belittling the idea of serving the poor. He says, man, you have plenty of time and plenty of opportunity. But what he was celebrating was that Mary understood something, understood that he was worth it. He was worth all of it. You think about our lives and you're assessing, well, what's the worth? Is, is it worth uh, giving up my prestige? Is it worth giving up my power, my reputation, my resources? The answer to that is the same now as it was then. It's worth it. It's worth it all. There's no question mark and there's no sitting on the fence. He confronts that and she is a beautiful picture of letting go of her material wealth or personal pride. Think about that. The question that we should ask in response is what do I treasure more than him? What am I say, would I say to myself, you know what, I'll, I'll give up this, I'll give up this, but I'm not willing to turn over this. 
like the story of the missionary by the name of John Patton. He was uh, connected with a home church and the story goes of him announcing to his home church that he, was, he and his wife and kids were headed to Southeast Asia where actually the tribe that they were trying to reach were known cannibals. An well, older gentleman in their church pulled him aside and said, this is, this is not a good idea. This is, in fact, a terrible idea. I love reading his response to the older gentleman. He says, my dear sir, you're getting up in years, and soon you will be laid in the grave and eaten by worms. <laughs> I don't know if I'd say that to an elderly gentleman. He said, but if I can but live and die honoring the Lord Jesus... It doesn't matter me, to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. And on resurrection day, my body will arise as fair as yours. Love that picture that he has. He says, either way, we have the same final destination. And what we do with our life, what degree of abandon. It's actually interesting if you stop and think about it. It's the exact opposite of what our mind would tell us. Our mind would say that man, maybe it's a waste of your life to, to, to pursue and follow Jesus. I would suggest just the opposite. You're wasting your life if your only pursuit is yourself and your desires, your wants. That's how you end up like Judas with regret and ultimately seeing the hopelessness that leads to, in his case, to suicide. We'll continue in the story. So that's one group of people people that were close to Jesus that you would say, man, they are fully in. Now this next group in verse nine would be the group that you would describe as vehemently opposed to Jesus. It says, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, Many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Pause there for a moment. Basically, we're seeing these loud, large crowds that are gathering because, not because they're necessarily committed to Jesus, but because they were thrill seekers, superficially interested in what Jesus had done, wanting to see for themselves that the, if the story was true. But you notice here, the religious leaders that are so desperately trying to protect what they had are really willing to go to whatever measure to protect the power and prestige that they've had put in place. Last week, you might remember, I talked about what a dangerous place is, an uh, uh, unbeliever is, what a dangerous person that is. If you think about it, when they don't see the value in human life, when they only are living for themselves, when they don't believe that they're accountable to the uh, God of the universe at the end of their day, without belief, a person can be a very dangerous person. And in this case, you see the spiral and the road that that takes you down. At first, they're like, man, in order to save the people, it would make sense for us to sacrifice one person. That was a logical argument. Now you notice they're willing, once you're willing to take one person's life, and now they're saying, now Lazarus has to go too. And you know, not just Jesus, the person that points to Jesus has to be taken out. The spiral of where that takes you. These people that are vehemently against and opposed to Jesus are going to do anything they can to resist the idea of him being Lord. We see that still today. Some people that, man, they are so dug in. They don't want to do anything that jeopardizes their freedom to sin, their freedom to pursue all the things they're after. They will not admit that Jesus is Lord. And that's such a heartbreaking place to see somebody at, but so often present in our culture. You can most likely even bring to somebody to mind in your circle of influence. That's the second group of people. Third, third group of people we see in verse 12, those that are conditionally committed. Verse 12, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. 
If you've spent any amount of time in the church, you're probably familiar with this. This is the description in the other accounts in the New Testament. The other gospels also share this story. What we call what? We call it the triumphal entry. I would suggest that maybe that's not even the, ne- the best title for it. I would suggest a better title might be the tragic entry because these Jews are coming, the crowds are gathering and they have one thing in mind of how Jesus is supposed to come and rescue them. We've talked a lot about this. They're under heavy Roman rule. And so the Jews are thinking, man, this is the Messiah that's going to come and set us free. That's gonna meet all of our demands. And as long as he does that, we are thrilled with him. They'd seen his miracles. They'd seen him provide food, bring back somebody back from the dead. And they're like, man, this is the moment where they get to cast their political vote. And you think about it, by their cheering, by their shouting, they are saying, this is who we vote for as our king. You can see why the religious leaders were a little concerned about this with Roman rule. Maybe the Romans might not like the idea of the of the Jewish their Jewish subjects announcing their new king. But either way, the people are worked up in a frenzy, a frenzy that was conditional on Jesus doing exactly what they want him to do. And that's still so often our experience, often with Jesus. We have this idea, as long as he does this, as long as he does this, as long as he checks this box, as long as he keeps my health in the right place, as long as my finances are in good shape, as as long as my family is in a good spot, and then I'm fully pro-Jesus. But soon as any of that collapses, man, I don't know. I'm shaking a fist. I'm denying his existence. I'm questioning whether he cares about me. But that's a wrong view of Jesus. That's why in John 16, 33, we're about to be told that in this life, there will be tribulation. There will be trial. It can't be a conditional commitment. Otherwise, when the storms of this life comes, man, it leaves our faith in such a vulnerable place. And that's what we see here with these people. They're they're gathering, they're celebrating. The timing was perfect. The Passover was about to uh, start. That was a symbolic event, remembering the provision of God that was rescued them from Egypt and uh, caused the death angel to pass them by. So they're saying some pretty powerful things. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. They're actually quoting the messianic prophecy about the Messiah found in Psalms 118. It's interesting that the word Hosanna, if you've never looked into it, the word Hosanna actually means save us now. So they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're shouting, save us now, save us now. This was a political rally of all political rallies. What does it say that they're waving? They're waving palm branches. In that day and age, that would be like an American flag of sorts. You see, about 150 years prior to Jesus, a guy by the name of Judas Maccabeus led a revolt that helped set them free from the oppression of the Syrians. And so after his setting them free, they all shook palm branches. So it became a traditional thing that would be done in a political sense. So here was even minted on their coins. So here they're shouting, uh, they're shouting Hosanna. They're shouting, save us now as they wave these political emblems. And here's the problem is when you put your hope in political things as your rescue, man, are we headed towards disappointment. You said, uh, man, uh, do I avoid uh, tough topics? I would say in the last year, we've leaned a little too far that direction, putting our hope in political things as our rescue, putting our hope in in men rather than God. Here's the problem, is that really, if you think about it, there's no good news outside of the kingdom of God politically. Really, if you think about any political system, there's really no good news other than the kingdom of God. And so any hope that we put in that, we're always going to be led to disappointment. That's why Jesus didn't get caught up in it. He didn't have any political agenda. He's like, man, political earthly kingdoms come and go, fail and succeed. It just depends where you're at on the curve, on the pendulum. 
Here we see instead these people had conditional commitments. They're watching with anticipation, but Jesus responds not exactly how they would have guessed or maybe even how they'd hoped. Look, verse 14, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him, uh, with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Basically, as I had mentioned, the leaders are panicking. They're subtly uh, realizing that things are getting out of control and slipping out of their grasp. The people are gathered. They've heard and some have seen Lazarus. They're gathered together and like, finally, he's coming. But what do we learn about how he shows up? He shows up as a servant rather than as a, a, a king like they would picture it. He shows up on a donkey. It's interesting that what had been prophesied in Zechariah 9.9 9, over 680 years prior was that he would show up on a donkey. See, in that day and age with a new king, he would arrive in one or two ways. As a king, if it's during war, if it's confronting some kind of a existing kingdom, they'd show up on a horse as a stallion, demonstrating their commitment to war or battle. In this instance, the exact opposite, a donkey represented peace. Peace because it's kind of slowly meandering in, wasn't coming in strength, it was coming at a time of peace. That wasn't exactly what the people were hoping. They're, they're hoping to, to lead a charge, to have them charge and ra ra rally up the troops and set them free. But instead, Jesus does the exact opposite. He's a peacemaker. You see, genuine love addresses our greatest need, not our perceived need. Our greatest need was for him to bring peace internally, not peace externally. He's like, first, before we can worry about some of the external stuff, we got to figure out how to have peace with God. You see, our sin creates a separation between us and our perfect God. And in order for us to ever have genuine peace in our life, we have to first be at peace with God. And that only comes through Jesus. That's what he's coming on that donkey. He's saying, I'm bringing peace. That's what their hearts long for. And they didn't even realize it. They were caught up in the externals, just like us today, caught up in all the peripheral things. And he's saying, let's first address the heart issue. Let's first address the separation. Internal peace is what you need. There's a day that's coming that he will arrive on a white horse. Actually, Revelations 19, 11 paints the picture perfectly. First, he comes as our rescue. Then in the future, he'll come as our judge. Well, the rescue is the piece that we should be paying attention to, to get right with God first. So the first thing he does is he addresses their greatest need. And he also sees straight through as to what's happening in their heart. What's fun to do in the, these book studies as you're kind of comparing the different gospels, each of the different gospels gives a few more details about this event. One of the other gospels, actually Luke 19, tells us a little bit of what transpired after he rides into the city. I just want to touch on that just for one minute. In verse chapter 19, verse 41 in Luke, we're told that as he drew near to the city, riding on the donkey, Everybody cheering his name, chanting his name. The king's finally here. They're waving palm branches. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As they're cheering, you would think that his response would be a smile on his face. Finally, they realize who I am. But instead, Luke 19, 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over it. He saw what was going on in their hearts. He knew that their, that their love was conditional and it would be 
fleeting. See, genuine, true love, a real commitment, sees past all those games, all the things that might appear to be something. And he says, oh man, my heart breaks. How long has I longed to gather you, we're told, like a, like a mother hen gathers, gathers its chicks, but instead they respond, unfortunately, with a temporal love. Jesus' response, first he addresses our greatest need. He also sees our heart in Luke 19, we also see what he does next, which isn't captured in the account in John. Luke 19, 45 says, After this, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. It's a wonderful uh, Jewish man in our church that we have some great conversations about Jesus. And he was asking me, he's like, man, why is it? Why is it that the Jews rejected Jesus? Why was it that they didn't embrace him as, as savior and king? And I would say these two points are exactly it. First off, he didn't meet their expectation to come as king. They were thinking he was going to come on a white horse, deliver them from Roman rule. Instead, comes on a donkey, doesn't meet their expectations there. When he arrives, what are we told that he does? He confronts their sin. Like talk about the best way to, to lose a popularity contest, like how to, how to lose a crowd. Man, start putting the flashlight on areas of their darkest sin. That's my, my, my wife and I have a kind of a running uh, debate as it relates to back massages. This is, stay with me here for a second. My wife, I'll give her a back massage, rub, rub her shoulder or something like that. And she's like, oh, stop it. I, I, I didn't know that that hurt and still, until you started to rub it. She's like, she's like that's, that's miserable. I was fine until you started digging in. But I'm like, honey, the only way to get past that is if you actually massage out that sore point. Do any of you, do you guys have these conversations? Or are we the only weird ones? <laughs> She's like, nope, we don't. Okay, so we're alone in this. But here, stay with me. Here's, here's the idea, is that Jesus, when he was showing up, he's like, I need to dig in and expose whatever is in the way of getting you from being like this, which is, kind of based on my whatever, if I do the right things, then you'll follow me to where Mary was at with full abandon of worship. And in order to do that, because he genuinely loves us, because he's crazy about us, he has to confront the obstacles that are in the way of our worship. So he shows up in the city and says, listen, first, this whole system of abuse, of the sacrificial system, taking advantage of it financially. We've talked about that in the past. Those things have to be rooted out in order for there to be genuine worship. That's how much he loves us. One, he shows up and offers the peace that we're so desperate for, whether we realize it or not. Two, his heart breaks if we're not at that place. Three, he says, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to expose sin, to root that out, to massage that out, if you will, so that you can be set free. That's what our God did upon arrival. Some responded, all right, I'm in. And some said, no, thank you to the invitation. We still, a couple thousand years later, have a decision to make with this. We have to realize that this is not an area where you can play Switzerland. It's not an area where you can say, say, I'm just kind of staying in the middle. This is an area where actually our lives depend on it. Our eternity determines it. The joy of this existence hinges on it, whether or not we're fully in or just kind of looky-loos, waiting to see what's going to transpire. My prayer is present day, that we, this wouldn't just be a message of something talked about a couple thousand years ago. This would be a message of a choice that we have on a daily basis, what degree we commit to him. I'll tell you what, as Jesus pointed out, there's nothing that we could give that would be a waste of giving it. Let me pray as we wrap up. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time in your word and we thank you for this picture as you move people towards decision. And really that's your ministry, moving people off of the fence to determine how they will respond to you, what degree of commitment they'll have, what level of intimacy they'll experience even in the here and now. Eternity's hinging on that choice. God, I pray for us as a church family, those of us that have maybe been taken off course in the past year, that there would be a coming back to this as a priority, learning from Mary in this example where we start our days on our faces at your feet. I'll tell you what, that's where an authentic relationship begins. I pray that for our church. I pray that for myself personally. I don't want this to be a distance thing that I bring up for other people, not myself. God, do a work in each one of us. We're dependent on your spirit for that. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
great church family. As always, so good to be together. I want to thank you just for those of you that keep being committed to staying in the Word through video each week. I hope this is an encouragement to you. God bless you. If there's any way we can serve you at all, obviously, always open. Feel free to reach out. God bless you. Have an amazing rest of your week. God bless you.